Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. This is Graceland Part 9, which makes it officially the longest series that I've ever preached. And since I know we're going to do at least Part 10 next week, that's pretty exciting. So, we're continuing to talk about what Graceland, or the Kingdom, actually is. And last week... We used Romans 14, 17, and we're going to use that for our base again tonight. And Romans 14, 17 in the King James Version says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Last week we talked about righteousness, this week we're talking about peace, and next week we're going to talk about joy. So let me read this in the Message Bible. I think it's interesting what it says in that translation. It says, God's kingdom isn't a matter of what you put in your stomach, for goodness sake. It's what God does with your life as he sets it right, puts it together, and completes it with joy. And that's that middle part there is what we're focusing on today, that, that putting it together part. Because what the word peace means is number 1515 in Strong's Greek Concordance. It means to join. Prosperity, quietness, rest, or one. So basically, what we think of as peace is not what God thinks of as peace. And again, the difference is, like we saw last week, our righteousness does not compare to Jesus' righteousness in the Holy Ghost. So what we're going to see here is what we think of as peace does not compare to peace in the Holy Ghost. Peace in the Holy Ghost, it's again, it's to join. It's a spirit of joining. It's, it means one. It means rest. So, what true peace is, I'll just give you the punchline right out of the gate, what true peace is, it's being at one with Jesus. It's having that, it's resting in Him, it's that joining to Him. And what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about how we get that peace, what it means to have that peace. Because generally speaking, I think what we think of when we think of peace is we think of an absence of of war. We think of an, an, like, a, like an uneasy alliance. We think of, well, we're not fighting with these people right now, so we have peace. But that kind of peace, that can come and go. That's a temporary peace. That's not really peace at all. That's not quietness. That's not rest. And that's certainly not prosperity. Which, again, that's, that's what peace is defined at. So, I don't really have a whole lot of passages to read. I just have a couple of verses here and there. But the first one I want to read is in the book of John, chapter 14. John 14, and I'm going to read in the King James, verses 26 and 27. And Jesus says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And the important part here that I really want to get across, again right from Jump Street, is Jesus says, My peace I give unto you. He says, Not as the world giveth. It's something better. It's a more excellent way. It's, and and as, as we're going to see, it, I, it's so hard for me not to get ahead of myself, but as we're going to see, the peace that we're talking about, it's not an uneasy alliance with your enemies. It's the fact that there are no more enemies. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at Jesus came and basically he conquered and then he positioned us to be more than conquerors. I preach this a lot, but I think it's something that we have to understand. You don't have to conquer. You don't have to do anything. You don't even have to fight because the battle has already been fought on the cross and the battle has already been won by Jesus. And now, on this side of the cross, what we enter into, again, we enter into Graceland, we enter into a land of peace, we enter into a land where, as we're going to see, it's not just that we have, uh, uh, like, we don't have a treaty with our enemies, we come to find out that we don't have any enemies. All of the enemies have already been defeated, and now we just get to enjoy this quietness, this rest, and this joining, this oneness with Jesus. So, in the Message Bible, John 14, starting with verse 25, says, I'm telling you these things while I'm still living with you. 
The friend, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send at my request, will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all the things I have told you. I am leaving you well and whole. That's my parting gift to you. Peace. I don't leave you the way you're used to being. Left. Feeling abandoned. Bereft. So don't be upset. Don't be distraught. See, a true peace, it comes from being whole. It comes from being in a position where you know that you're with, and, and, and again, in my theology, even, for, even more than being with, you are Jesus. As he is, so are we in this world. And that's what he says. He says, I'm telling you this while I'm still living with you because you need to understand this so that when I come live in you, then you can start to really have a sense of peace. You don't have to worry about God showing up in an instant because wherever you go, that's where God is because he's inside of us. We don't have to wait for him to show up because where we go, he goes. And again, if we understand that God is an omnipresent God, that means he's everywhere at all times anyway. There's nowhere that you can be that he isn't. And again, I think that's, that's where our peace comes from. It comes from that assurance of even if it looks dark, as soon as the light comes, it's not dark anymore. It may look like you have enemies, but Jesus already conquered them. It may look like you have problems, but Jesus already solved them. So when we start to come into an understanding of what true peace is, that, again, that joining, where we can say, listen, I, I believe it's in the book of Hebrews, it says, everything is under our feet, but we don't see everything under our feet, but we see Jesus. And the more we see Jesus, the more we join with him, the more we uh, understand that, we are together, we are one, we are all the same. The more we get to that place, that's where our peace comes from. Because then it's not, God, I need you to do this for me. Then it's understanding, God already did this for us, and now we can walk in it. Now we can just lay hold of it. Now we can just enjoy it. So, my next passage is in the book of Isaiah. I have a couple of Old Testament passages I want to read. This is kind of a familiar one, but I really think we need to spend a little bit of time on it. And uh, while we're turning to Isaiah 53, I want to read Matthew 10, 34. I think this is, again, another important aspect of Jesus' earthly ministry that we need to start to understand. I, I mean, it, I'm having a problem lately, especially lately, with people trying to identify themselves with Jesus' earthly ministry. As if to say, we need to follow Jesus, we need to do what he did, that whole WWJD uh, phenomenon, when what we, we don't really need to try to figure out what would Jesus do. What we need to start to come into a realization of is, what did Jesus do? And what I mean by that is, what did Jesus do on the cross? What was the transformation that he gave us? I don't want to be like Jesus when he walked the earth, and in fact I can't be like Jesus when he walked the earth. Most of the stuff Jesus did in his earth walk, he did to fulfill things. He did them to fulfill the law, to fulfill the scripture, to fulfill the prophecies that were made about him. And we don't have to do that. We don't have to fulfill the law because he already did. We don't have to fulfill the prophecies about him because they were about him. And that's again, that's why one of my favorite verses in 1 John that I quote all the time, it does not say, as Jesus was, so are we in this world. It says, as he is, so are we in this world. And as he is, is he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's raised above every other name and every other circumstance. So that's how we are. That's the peace we have. It's not even to say, well, God has empowered me to go and conquer. That's not it at all. See, what the situation is, is Jesus came and conquered and empowered us to live in a new world, a new dimension, a new kingdom where the conquering doesn't need to happen because it already happened on the cross. And I think this is a part of, of Jesus that people miss where we think it's more important to figure out how he acted and then try to act that way. But again, I'm convinced that if you're trying to act like somebody else, even if it's Jesus, A, all you're doing is acting, and B, you're setting yourself up to fail because you cannot walk in his footsteps. Only one man could ever live Jesus' life, and his name is Jesus. So what we have to understand is, I'm not trying to live Jesus' life, I'm letting him live his life in me. And that's where the shift comes, that's where the switch comes. That's when it's not trying to clean up an old man Adam, that's where it's 
putting the old man Adam to death in a watery grave of baptism and rising up as a new man, Jesus. So what I wanted to read in Matthew 10, 34, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Which, you know, in light of the fact that he is the Prince of Peace, that can start out and you can say, wait a minute, hold on, what is he talking about here? Which, honestly, I find myself doing a lot when I read anything that Jesus said. I'm like, hold on, wait a minute, what are you saying? And I think that's the same way the disciples were. I think the people who really understood what Jesus said a lot of the times were the Pharisees, except they didn't like what he said, so they rejected it. But I think if you're really looking for truth, what you can see here is Jesus said, I'm not sending peace on earth. What I'm doing is I'm bringing a sword so that I can bring peace to earth by using the sword to get rid of anything that would stand in the way of peace, by getting rid of anything in the world that would cause you to not have peace. And again, what we understand here when he says a sword, what the Bible describes as the sword is the word of God. And who Jesus is, is the word of God. So when you see the scripture where it says, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, that's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the one who divides between uh, whatever it says, bone and marrow, and between the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus is the one who gets rid of all of the stuff that he doesn't want there. And again, what we understand from a, a, a finished work perspective is Jesus already did that. And what we're doing, we're not waiting for him to do that. What we're doing is we're coming into the knowledge of what he's done. And that's what he said in the, uh, in the first passage we read in John. He said, the Holy Ghost is going to bring to remembrance all the things that I've said, all the things that I've done. It's all inside of you. You have everything you need. And as the Holy Ghost literally takes you by the hand and leads you into all truth, that's when we start to appropriate this righteousness, peace, and joy that is found in the Holy Ghost. So what we need to see here is that Jesus didn't come, as it says, to send peace. He came with a sword, and he came as a sword. So what he had to do first, he had to conquer. He had to make a way for peace. And again, he did that on the cross. So that brings us to Isaiah 53, and I want to read verses 4 and 5. Again, I think these are uh, familiar scriptures. I think we hear them a lot. But I think almost kind of the problem with these, these really, really familiar scriptures is we kind of lose sight of how powerful they are. Because they get familiar for a reason. They get familiar because... This is stuff that we really need to know, but we, you know, we hear them so much that it's almost like, oh, great, okay, yeah, Isaiah, I got it. But it's really strong, it's really powerful, it really tells the tale of what, what Jesus came to do. So Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So what we see is, as clear as I can make it, Jesus paid the price for our peace. Jesus took everything that would cause us to be in a place of unrest, be it sorrows or griefs or even our transgressions, our guilt, when we think we've messed up. Jesus said, listen, I'm going to take that too. I'm not going to punish you for that. I'm going to redeem you from that. I'm going to take the punishment. I'm going to wrap you up in me. Because again, listen, what we have to understand about Jesus dying both for us and as us, it's not about escaping punishment. It's about punishment rendered and then a transformation taking place. And that's, the, again, the biggest thing that I don't think people really truly understand about Jesus is... It's not so much about what he did before the cross, it's about what he did on the cross and after the cross and what that means for us on this side of the cross. We're so stuck in an Old Covenant, Old Testament mentality where we think, you know, I still hear people saying, well, the Bible says an eye for an eye. And Jesus literally came and said, you've heard these things, an eye for an eye, but let me show you a better way. Let me give you something more than that. Let me give you something peaceful in the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, if somebody slaps you, don't slap them back, turn the other cheek. Jesus said, if somebody takes your shirt, give them your coat. 
Jesus said, heap grace and love onto other people, and that's the, the, the true way to be in Graceland. Because again, what we understand, and I hope I've been doing an okay job the last couple of months of, of showing us that Graceland's not a place, Graceland's a person. The church isn't somewhere you go, the church is who we are. So what we understand is that Jesus did everything, both for us and as us. He did all of the necessary, he jumped through all of the hoops, he took away all of the bad, and he took away all of the good, and then he transformed that into just him. Because see, again, I think one of the pe reasons that people are so stuck on, we have to, well, we at least have to follow the Ten Commandments. That's what I hear sometimes too. Say whatever you want about all the, the, the ceremonial laws and all the sacrificial laws. You can get rid of those if you want. But we have to follow the Ten Commandments. And I think the reason that people have that mindset is, if you look at the Ten Commandments, they're good. If you could obey them, if you could follow them, you would lead a good life. Those are good moral rules. But again, what we have to come to understand is that good and evil, we're on the same tree. And God's not interested in that tree at all. He's not interested in the evil or the good. What he's interested in is the tree of life. What he's interested in is not Adam or anything that Adam can do or anything that Adam can't do. What he's interested in is his son Jesus. And again, that's why he said it's our, it's, we have been predestinated to be conformed into the image of his son. And again, the way I see that is that on the cross, that being conformed into the image of Jesus, that happened 2,000 years ago on the cross. We are conformed into his image. That's a done deal. That's not going to happen. That happened. So again, what we're doing is we're not transforming. We're not being conformed. What we're doing is we're learning what we've been transformed into. We're coming into a place where we start to understand more and more who, not again, not who Jesus was, but who Jesus is and where Jesus is and what that means to us right now. And this, these verses in Isaiah, I think, do, do an excellent job of really trying to help us get rid of some of the things that cause so much unrest in our lives. I'm going to read them again. The griefs, the sorrows, uh, our transgressions, our iniquities, and, uh, you know, by his stripes we are healed. That means anything, any, any sickness, any disease, anything in your life that causes you to not be at rest, you don't have to struggle with it. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to conquer it. What you have to do is you have to understand that Jesus came as a sword, and he fought it, and he conquered it, and now it's not an issue anymore. And it, listen, I understand that that's easy to say, and it's not always so easy to walk in, but when we stop looking at those things, and we start looking at Jesus, then we can see that what's really important is not our circumstances. What, what's really important is not being a conqueror, but what's important is being more than a conqueror. What's important is appropriating what Jesus did for our lives. But again, unless we understand what he did, I don't think we can do anything with it. So when we see that he, again, he was the chastisement of our peace, it was upon him. He paid the price for it. He made the way for it. That makes it easy for me to say, okay, God, then if Jesus paid for it, and then he gave it to me as a gift, then I'm not going to try to pay for it. I'm not going to try to be at peace. I'm not going to try to be at rest. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus and I'm going to see why I can be at peace. I'm going to see why I can be at rest. And then, and, and then you know, just believe in him and become what I believe. So the next couple of verses I want to read is in 1 Kings chapter 5. This is a cool one because I think, again, it really sets the stage for how we got to where we are. Because in 1 Kings chapter 5, we're talking about David and we're talking about his son Solomon. And David was, King David was a man of war. He fought his whole life. Even when he was a young boy as a shepherd, he was out in the wilderness killing bears and lions to protect the sheep. He was a picture of Jesus in his earth walk ministry. Which again, that's not the pattern we're supposed to follow. The pattern we're supposed to follow is 
Jesus in his resurrected life. Because what we've been saying is there's a better way. There's life and there's resurrection life. There's the world and there's the kingdom or Graceland. There's always something better and what it is is his name is Jesus. So again, who we're supposed to identify with, we're not supposed to identify with David, we're supposed to identify with Solomon. We're not supposed to identify with David going out and fighting the wars. As we're going to see, we're supposed to identify with Solomon who, who doesn't have any wars to fight. So in 1 Kings 5, in the King James, I want to read verses 3 and 4. And Solomon says, Thou knowest how that, my, how that David my father could not build an house unto the name of the Lord his God, for the wars which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. And I want to key on this real quick. Even though David was the one fighting all the wars, it was the Lord who was really fighting and winning all of the wars. And that we can identify with because, listen, even if you see something that you think you need to fight, God's the one who really is fighting it or, you know, more accurately, already fought it. It's all about what he did. It's, and it's nothing about what we can do or should do or need to do. Jesus said over and over and over again, he said, only believe, simply believe, just believe. And again, I, I think on Friday I'm going to preach about faith, and I think I touched on it last week here. The thing about faith is it's not about having enough faith to make things happen. It's about having enough faith to believe that Jesus made things happen through his faith. We don't live by our faith in the Son of God. We live by the faith of the Son of God. It's His perfect faith that makes things go, that makes things happen. And all our faith has to do is get us to that place where we believe in Him, where we believe in Jesus. That's why Jesus said, the work of the New Testament creature is believing in God and the one who God sent. Period. That's all you have to do. That's all. All you have to do. You don't have to do Ten Commandments. You don't have to do laws. You don't have to... All you have to do is believe in Jesus. And that's why, again, it says here that David could not build a house unto God. That was in David's heart. David wanted to build a temple for God, and, and God said, You can't build it for me. You're a man of war. And that's not the kind of person that builds the house. So, what we see in verse 4, it says... But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil a current. Solomon couldn't have fought a war if he wanted to, because he didn't have any enemies. There was no evil anywhere around him. God had given him rest on every side because of the work that Solomon's father did. And it's the same with us, where the work that our father, God, did on the cross allows us, his children, to be in a place where there's nothing to fight. There's no enemies. There's no evil. There's nothing that we need to do other than to enjoy the rest that God has given us on every side. And that's why it talks about in the Bible, we always think we have to chase down blessings, but what the Bible says is the blessings are going to overtake us. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to earn anything. All we have to do is receive things and then release the things that we receive. That's what I posted on Facebook. I think it was either today or yesterday. I said, before you can give grace, you have to receive grace. Because you can't give something you don't have. And I think that's where we get so stuck on is, is we get hurt by somebody. We, we, don't, we lose our peace, so to speak. And then we go around and we're like, you know, we're mean to people. We put this wall up, we put our guard up, and we say, I'm not letting anybody hurt me like that again. And by doing that, we end up hurting other people unintentionally sometimes and intentionally even sometimes because we say, I got burned before, I'm not getting burned again. So if I have to burn you so that I don't get burned, that's a price I'm willing to pay. What we have to do is we have to receive before we can release. We have to allow God to show us that, listen, even though somebody else might have hurt us, he's got this, He is the solution. He is the balm in Gilead, so to speak that will, you know, soothe our wounds. That's what we saw in Isaiah, that by His stripes we are healed. Nobody's ever done anything to us like they did to Jesus. 
he took the worst punishment, the worst ridicule, the worst even all the way up to death that anybody could take. So when we think we're going through something, and listen, I'm not saying we don't go through stuff. Obviously, we go through stuff. But with this joining together with Jesus, there's nothing that we can go through that he hasn't already gone through. There's nothing that can phase us when we understand that, listen, I'd say it like this. Because Jesus is holding us up, nothing can drag us down. How could it? It would have to be stronger than Jesus, and there is nothing stronger than Jesus. And we, when we start to understand this picture of the Father conquering and the Son resting in that victory, then we start to see that even the things that we think are problems, they're working together for our good. I, I mean, for a while there, it felt like, and, and in some ways, a lot of times, it still feels like it. It feels like things are always shaking. It feels like things are always in a state of unrest. But I came to the place where I could start to see that God was shaking things so that he could put them in his divine order. So even though it looked rocky, what it was really doing was God was just smoothing everything out. So, again, what we see here, if there's no adversary or evil occurring, if Jesus cursed the fig tree, which, again, I, I believe is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, if Jesus got rid of that whole entire tree, that whole entire mindset, that whole entire way of thinking where, where we say we've got good on one side and evil on the other side and, and, and those two forces are fighting with each other, God said that, you know, that is the way that it used to be, but that's not the way that it is anymore. There's nothing to fight anymore. Darkness flees when the light is shining. So what we understand is the more light we shine, the more clearly we see things, and the more we understand that we are where we want to be. We are transformed already. We have been conformed into His image. But again, what the light does is it shows us what that really looks like in our own lives. So let me read this in the Message Bible, starting with verse 1. It says... Hiram, king of Tyre, sent ambassadors to Solomon when he heard that he had been crowned king in David's place. Hiram had loved David his whole life. Solomon responded, saying, You know that David my father was not able to build a temple in honor of God because of the wars he had to fight on all sides, until God finally put them down. But now God has provided peace all around. No one against us, nothing at odds with us. This is what a real, honest, true believer in Jesus needs to come to understand. There's no one against us, and there's really nothing at odds with us. So even if it looks like someone's against us, they're really not. They just don't know that they're with us yet. That's again, that's why I, I like to quote Paula on this one, because her heart, I think, understands this concept more than anybody I know. She says, I don't have any enemies. I have friends and people who don't know they're my friends yet. And I think that's how it is on this side of the cross where we understand that we are all one in Him. We are all members of the same body. And just because somebody doesn't know they're a member of the body, that's no reason to hate them, that's no reason to fight with them. What that is is a reason to shine some light, not only so that we can see, but so that they can see. And again, when it goes on to say, nothing at odds with us, if you're in a situation that you think something is working against you, what I want to tell you is, it's working, but it's working for you. That's why one of the most, again, another popular verse says, all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. And what I want to tell you is, listen, there's something inside of you, even if you don't know it, even if you haven't accepted it yet, there's something inside of you that loves the Lord because he first loved you. And when again, when you start to receive that love, that's when you can start to return that love, release that love. That's when you can start to see that because God loves me, everything in my life will be and is being used to my advantage. It's not at odds against me. All the odds are for me. My judgment is not going to be in the negative because my judgment was already in the positive. I was judged in Christ and he was judged righteous. And he gave, last week we, we, we showed this, he gave that righteousness, his righteousness to me. I didn't earn it because I couldn't earn it. If I could earn it, it would have been my righteousness. And my righteousness, I believe it's, a, I believe it's in Isaiah, 
what God says about my righteousness is that it amounts to filthy rags. It doesn't amount to anything. It's useless. You can't even clean anything with a filthy rag. All you can do is make it more dirty. And I think that's where we get in our lives when, when we see something and we think it's a bad situation and we think it's at odds against it. We want to try to use our effort to clean it up, but all we're doing is we're scrubbing it with a filthy rag and we're not providing peace to anything. We're just providing more unrest. We're magnifying what looks like a bad situation rather than magnifying the Lord in what looks like a bad situation. And whatever we magnify, whatever we confess, whatever we speak, whatever we believe, that's what's going to manifest. If you wake up in the morning and you say, man, today's going to be terrible, it probably will. But if you wake up in the morning and you give God a high five and you say, yes, I'm excited today because I know what's living inside of me, then your day's already off to the best start that it can be off to. And when, again, I think I preached this on Friday, when the first fruit is holy, the whole lump is holy. If we start out in a God place, then it'll all flow from there. And I think that's what we need to, we need to stop seeing enemies, we need to stop seeing evil, we need to stop seeing people and situations against us, and we need to start understanding that if God is for us, who can be against us? And again, I don't, I don't think that that means if God is for us, who can prevail against us? I think it means if God is for us, and if God is in all of us, then there's no, there, there's no line, there's no sides. All there is is Jesus. The messianic rebirth of the world took out everything that wasn't Him and left Him. And that's where we stand today. We stand in a position of peace. We stand in a position of rest and quietness because we understand not only that, I, I don't, listen, we need to understand that it's not just me who's at one with Jesus, it's all of us. And my job is to, to help us see that we are all connected to the source of life. So, I want to read, I think that's, yeah, that's, I just, I want to read one more scripture. I want to read John 16, 33 in the Amplified Bible. And I think this is really, really cool. It says, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer. Take courage. Be confident, certain, and undaunted. For I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. That's an outstanding thing for Jesus to say to us. That verse, if that verse doesn't give you peace, then, then there's nothing that I can do for you. Because if he says, listen, Jesus was a realist. He said, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trials. You're going to have distress and frustration. That's, that's part and parcel to being a human being. We go through stuff. But the trick is, in Jesus, because of Jesus, even though we go through stuff, we don't have to let stuff go through us. We don't have to get wrecked by a situation. We can say, wait a minute, greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. We can say, wait a minute, I don't have to, what does it say here? I can take courage. I can be confident, certain, and undaunted that this situation, it's not working for my bad, it's working for my good. Why? Because Jesus has overcome the world. There was the, the world, the way, that we, the way that we think we know it now, a dark world, a, a dog-eat-dog -dog world. But Jesus came and he, he, basically he brought a sword and he brought some fire and he got rid of that whole world and he purified it and he transformed it into himself, into Graceland, into the kingdom of God, into a place where, again, we understand that the kingdom is the, the realm where the king rules and reigns. And that's where we live right now. And, and, and again, the tricky part is, is that's where we live right now, but if we want to live there, then we have to acknowledge the king's rule and reign. We have to come to a place where we say, I don't care what it looks like, I care what God says about it. We have to come to a place where we walk by faith and not by sight. And this is the verse, again, 
to me, this is what gives us the ability to do that. Because faith is not a blind leap in the dark, and faith is not a blind leap in the light. Faith is God showing you how good He is, and then you saying, "All right, man, if this, if, if this, if this God, this great, wonderful, beautiful, perfect God, is showing me that He's got my back, then what could I possibly have to worry about?" If Jesus already overcame the world, and this is the part I love that the Amplified Bible adds to the verse, if Jesus has already deprived the world of power to harm me and has conquered it for me, man, that puts you in a place of unshakable peace. And again, that's what it says, perfect peace. Not peace as the world gives to you. Not peace where we think, I'm stronger than this guy, so he's probably not going to attack me. Because, you know, in that kind of peace, what if he does? But if we say, Jesus, the strongest one of all, came and got rid of everything else, then there's nobody to attack us. We are in a place where, again, like it says in 1 Kings, there's neither adversary nor evil occurring. And I feel like a lot of Christians, we want to look for stuff to fight, we want to look for stuff to be against, but I think that's missing the whole entire point. I don't think it's important what we're against. I think it's important who we are for. Or, more accurately, I think it's important who is for us. See, in the Old Testament, and I used to love this verse until God showed me something. In the Old Testament, when Joshua was ready to bring the people in the Promised Land, when they first entered, Joshua came up to the angel of God, who is Jesus. And Joshua said, are you for us or for our enemies? And the angel said, You've got it all wrong. I'm not for anybody. I'm for I'm for God. So then I always used to think, well, as long as we're for God, then we'll be safe. And then I started to understand that 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 again, that's an old covenant mindset. That's a place where we say, I have to do something to earn something. I have to be for God before he'll be for me. Not even understanding that the whole time God has always been for us. The whole time God was just even before the foundation of the world, God was so for us that He sent His only begotten Son to die, not only for us, but as us, to bring us into a place where we can understand that God is for us. And that's why Jesus said here again, He says, I have conquered it for you. Jesus didn't just conquer the world because He thought it would be a good idea. He conquered it for you so that you could live in a world where you could have perfect peace. He conquered it so you could live in a world where His rule and His reign was the law of the land. He conquered it for you, so that not so that He wouldn't have any enemies, because I don't think God has ever had any enemies, but so that you wouldn't have any enemies. So that every situation that came into your life would not be against you, but it would be for you. And again, the tricky part is, it doesn't always look like that. It looks like, you know, it looks like things go wrong sometimes. It looks like, you know, setbacks happen. Which again, what we saw here, distress, frustration, trials, tribulation. I think we can all testify that we've had some of that in our lives, to some degree. But again, the trick is, is it's, are we going, if, if we are in, dis, listen, are, if we're in distress, is distress going to be in us? Or if we're in distress, is peace going to be in us? And we start, when we start to understand that peace is in us, not as the world gives, but, but perfect peace, Jesus' peace, peace that's found in the Holy Ghost, then it doesn't matter what's distressing us, because first of all, it's not distressing God. I think we've missed the point even on prayer when, when we come to God and we say, Oh God, you have to fix this situation for me. You have to change things. You, I need a breakthrough. When I, I truly believe that God is saying, I broke through 2,000 years ago. On the cross, I took care of this problem. It's not a problem. That's why I can say that I don't believe the sin issue is a problem for God. I don't believe that God has any problem. I think God's only concern is that He wants us to know and believe in His Son so that we can start to live the abundant life that Jesus came and died and rose again to give us. I think God's only concern is, I've given these people everything but they don't understand. Just like when the children of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness and every single day God supplied them with manna. 
really what he supplied them with was bread from heaven, and the people called it manna, which means what is it? They didn't even understand what God was doing for them. We never understand how good of a God we serve because we flipped the whole thing around where we think service means we have to do things for Him when He's saying, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. I didn't come to bring peace. I didn't come, you know, He's saying, I came to bring a sword. I came to get rid of anything. I don't have to give you peace. I have to get rid of everything that would take your peace away from you. I have to give you a peace that's unshakable. Not a temporary peace, but an everlasting peace. Not a here today, gone tomorrow peace, but a perfect peace. A peace that allows us to understand that He did it not, I'm going to switch this around, usually I say not only for us, but as us, but what we need to understand is He did it not only as us, but for us. Everything Jesus came to do was for our good. And when He transformed the, the, the world into the kingdom, He made it into a place where there's nothing but Him. There's nothing but good. All of the promises in Jesus are yea and amen. When you get a no from God, it's not a rejection, it's a redirection. Because sometimes what we ask for, that's not good for us. Sometimes what we want from God in the long run is not what we need. And that's why Paul said, I believe it was Paul, said, My God shall supply all my need according to His riches and glory. And I think actually what he says is, My God shall supply all your need. Paul wasn't even worried about his own need because he knew God had him covered. But he said, listen, until we all understand that, I'm going to tell you, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. And again, that's really how he supplies it, is, is by his glory. That's how he supplies us with everything. Everything we need comes from Jesus, who is the literal glory of the eternal Heavenly Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the 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 visible face of an invisible God. But again, I think that's, you know, that's where we get to the place where we say, I have to act like Jesus. You don't have to act like anybody. All you have to do is you have to let Jesus do what he wants to do in you and through you. And when you do that, then it starts to, again, it's not, it's not uh, unrest, it's rest. If I let Jesus do what he wants to do, I can sit back and I can rest, which doesn't mean that I'm not doing anything. It just means that, it means Tom's not doing anything. It means Jesus is doing things in me, which I heard it, it was really cool. I heard it the other day. One of my good friends, he said, a Christian at rest looks a lot like a Christian who's working because that posture of rest will produce good things. Again, you know, we're not saved by good works, but we're saved unto good works. Good works flow out of a position of rest because everything that Jesus does is a good work. So everything that he does in me looks like me doing a good work. And I think that's, again, that's where we get, we get tricky with, with, we get so tricky with things where we say, what do you mean rest? What's rest? Not doing anything? No. Rest, quite simply, is Holy Spirit directed activity. If God tells you to do something, do it. And that's what being at rest is. You're not struggling. You're not trying to do something. You're not coming up with anything. You're just listening to God and doing what doing what He prompts you to do. And that, that I think, again, it comes right back to where we started. That's that spirit of joining, that spirit of connection, that oneness with Jesus, where it stops being, I have to do what Jesus wants me to do, and it starts being, Jesus is doing stuff, and He's using me to do it. And I think that's truly about as, as peaceful and quiet and prosperous as you can get. Amen.